Case Western Reserve University's Institute for the Science of Origins proudly presents the Origins Science Scholars Program. The Institute advances the scientific understanding and application of the origins and evolution of human and natural systems. The Origins Science Scholars Lectures are presented with the assistance of Case Western Reserve University's Siegel Lifelong Learning Program, College of Arts and Sciences, and MediaVision. It's my pleasure tonight to introduce Professor Hirsch Matur. Professor Matur is Professor of Physics at Case Western Reserve University. He is what I would call a Renaissance scientist, applying the principles of physics to a vast variety of subjects and problems, from cosmology to art, materials to language. Tonight, he'll talk to us about the solar system as a laboratory for fundamental physics. Please join me in welcoming Professor Matur. Thanks, Glenn. And uh, thanks everyone for coming. I wish we were in person, uh, but it's good to have you all here virtually. So the image on this slide was taken by the Voyager spacecraft uh, from the outer solar system beyond the orbit of Neptune. It shows Earth as a point of light that maybe you can't see very well over Zoom, but ask me in Q&A and I'll, I'll magnify it. Um, it seemed like a good place to start the talk, uh, which is concerned with the outer solar system, but also because later in the series, we learn about the fragility of our planet, uh, the tiny sparkling jewel in this photograph. Um, I stole the title of the first part of my talk from Johannes Kepler, um, and I'm trying to evoke his times uh, with this woodcut of a comet. If you look at the sky at night, uh, you can easily recognize the planets. Venus is brighter than any star, and the other planets are also among the brighter points of light um, in the night sky. Uh, but what is more distinctive about the planets than their brightness is the fact that they move. Um, as the stars rise and set, they maintain their relative positions, and so the constellations look the same um, from night, night after night. But the planets move relative to the background pattern of stars. Understanding this movement uh, of the planets is one of the oldest scientific problems. Um, indeed, understanding the movement of planets uh, in part gave birth to science. The regularities in their motion um, gave rise to the hope that the universe was comprehensible and that nature obeyed laws. So in this talk, I'd like to take you um, to the current frontier and tell you what we hope to learn today by studying the movement of objects uh, in the solar system. So I'm going to start here with this book, uh, which was acquired by a library by, in its first ray manuscript collection um, last year. Um, it's a 400-year-old book. Um, it's uh, Johannes Kepler's first book uh, called The Cosmic Mystery. And uh, so this might be a good place for us to start our exploration of the solar system. Uh, today, Johannes Kepler is more of a monument than a man, as you can see from um, this posted stamp, uh, this crater that's named after him. There's a mountain range na named after him. Uh, but he, uh, So he is truly a monumental scientific figure. But behind that, behind that person is actually, behind that monumental figure, is actually somebody who was a really interesting person and a great scientist. Um, I don't have time to peel back the curtain on Kepler's personal history, although it's very interesting. Here you can see a photograph of the seminary that he attended, uh, somewhat irregularly because of family finances. Um, but uh, he, st he studied there. Initially, he hoped to study theology but eventually, because of his irregular attendance, he was diverted into astronomy, um, luckily for, for uh, the sake of posterity. Um, there are at least two figures in his life, though, that I must mention, even though I'm going to mostly focus on the science. Uh, one is his remarkable uh, mother, Katharina uh, Goldman, who was an herbalist, a healer, and she was tried for witchcraft, which uh, actually took up many years of Kepler's life, trying to get her acquitted from that. And another strong personality in his life was his mentor, uh, Brahe, who was a wealthy nobleman and a noble, noted astronomer. In fact, I, I have to say a little bit about Brahe because uh, it folds in with their scientific collaboration. So Brahe was a Danish aristocrat, uh, but in the court of Rudolf II because he was exiled from Denmark. He's a colorful figure. Uh, what do I mean by that? Well, uh, for, for, for example, uh, the reason that he was exiled, we don't know exactly why he was exiled, but there's some speculation that he might have been the model for Shakespeare's, for, for the evil uncle in Hamlet, because he had an affair with the queen, and that is possibly the reason why he, um, he was also 
uh, a great partier, and this was the source of a lot of tension between Kepler and Brahe because Kepler lived in Brahe's household, and basically they would party every night. He had a pet elk, and the party ended when the pet elk dropped drunk. So it was, uh, you know, the original party animal. Um, so, so I, I think Kepler, who was very serious-minded, did not really enjoy this, and I think that was part of the source of tension between them. Um, Brahe died under rather mysterious circumstances. Um, and in fact, his body has been exhumed twice because it's rumored that he was murdered. Um, and Kepler is in fact among the suspects because they had um, you know, uh, tension and conflicts uh, over various matters. Um, what has been discovered is that he definitely died of heavy metal poisoning, but whether it was murder or just uh, self-inflicted because he was an alchemist and also he had a gold and silver nose, uh, whether it's somehow connected to those things, uh, we don't really know. But what we know for sure is that Brahe was a great um, observational astronomer, and he compiled over decades, uh, both in Denmark and then in, in Czechoslovakia, uh, he compiled uh, this incredible um, uh, database, uh, I guess we would say now, um, of planetary positions and stellar positions. And he mentored, he was, a, he was a strong scientific mentor to Kepler. He recognized his talent and brought him to the court of Rudolf. Um, and eventually uh, th this led to Kepler's great discoveries. So what are those discoveries? Um, so the three laws uh, that Kepler is uh, famous for, uh, if you've done an introductory course in physics in high school or, or, or in college, uh, you may have heard of these laws. Uh, the first of these laws says that the orbit of a planet is an ellipse, not a circle as Copernicus had imagined, but an ellipse which is basically a squished circle, as you can see in this picture. The thing about an ellipse is, whereas a circle has just a single center, an ellipse has two points that are kind of special, and they're both called the focus of the ellipse, they're symmetrical. And here in this diagram, you can see the, the foci of this ellipse. So an ellipse is characterized by two quantities. One is its major axis, um, which is basically the length of the ellipse. And then the other is the eccentricity, which is a measure of how squished it is. Uh, so the two things that characterize its shape. And according to Kepler, the orbit of a planet is an ellipse with the sun sitting at one focus and there's nothing at the other focus. Kepler's second law is called the area law. And um, what it says basically is that a planet moves faster when it's closer to the sun and it slows down when it's um, far away from the sun. And it describes a very precise and quantitative way. The third law of Kepler is called the harmonic law, which tells you that if a planet is in a bigger orbit, if it's farther from the sun, um, then it takes longer to go around the sun. So Mars is the next planet out from the sun, for, uh, from the sun after Earth. And they go in the order Mercury, Venus, Mars. And as you go further out, the year of the planet, the time it takes to go around the sun grows longer in a precise way that's described by uh, Kepler's harmonic law. There's a fourth important discovery that Kepler made, which uh, I think should be elevated to uh, the status of his fourth law, um, which may maybe we'll skip over though, because it's a little technical. Um, it just describes um, precisely how the planet goes around the ellipse and how you can figure out where it is at any given moment in time. And this is called the anomaly equation. So these are the laws. In three, three short laws, he's succinctly captured everything that you need to know to forecast the uh, positions of the planets for thousands of years into the future. Uh, now, how did he make this discovery? I think this is, this is worth uh, at least emphasizing how difficult it really was. Because what Brahe was measuring was not exactly the positions of the planets, but just the direction they're in. Um, he, he could tell us which direction they were in, but not how far away they are, which is the third thing you need in order to figure out exactly what their position is. So it's as though he was just watching shadows of the planets on the sky. And from these, he had to infer their full three-dimensional motion. And so it is really a remarkable feat that he was able to do this uh, without computers. Um, and so, uh, in fact, this is his monumental work called the Rudolphine Tables, which took him more than 20 years to compile. This, is, this contained the complete summation of all his work, or, or I should say rather contained all the details. The summation is in those laws. But here uh, in the Rudolphine Tables, he first of all compiled all of Brahe's data, thousands of star charts, positions of planets over decades. Um, Kepler called it his chief astronomical work. Um, and it's, it's a little bit heartbreaking to see what a lot of work he had to do because of the lack of computers 
things that we could do at a keystroke now. Uh, this great man had to spend months calculating. He, he compiled tables of logarithms to help himself with the calculations. He compiled tables of solutions to the anomaly equation, which you could solve on a handheld calculator or on your phone for that matter. Um, he gave instructions and examples in Latin. And uh, here's one of the impressive things he did. Uh, I think this is impressive. I mean, everything is so impressive, but this is something that's almost comprehensible. You can almost imagine doing it yourself. So it seems the more impressive. Uh, he was able to find that the planet Venus, because it's closer to the, to the sun, uh, it'll sometimes pass in front of the sun uh, as seen from the earth. So we just see this black speck moving across the face of the sun. These are called transits of Venus and both Mercury and Venus transit have these transits. Um, and uh, Kepler was able to figure out the pattern to these and predict the next one. Not an easy calculation. So for any graduate students in physics uh, in the audience, um, try it out sometime. You have all the tools, but it's not that easy. Uh, however, Kepler, so this is the monumental work uh, for which Kepler is so revered today. Um, but Kepler wasn't really satisfied with this. This was nice, but he had more profound questions. He wanted to know why are there six planets and what explains the shape and size of their orbits? Um, looking back now, we don't think these are very good questions. We think it's more or less an accident that there are, the number of planets is an accident and the shape and size of the orbits also is a historical accident that just happened because of the way the gas condensed into the solar system when it formed. But Kepler didn't know that. And I think in a way, if you look at some of the questions that particle physicists ask, like why are there three dimensions or why do we have three generations of elementary particles, you can feel a sneaking sympathy for Kepler. Uh, and the terms in which Kepler tried to answer these questions was um, through geometry, because in his day, it was believed, in fact, that geometry somehow uh, has some deep connection to the nature of the universe. Um, so, so one of the ideas Kepler had was, if, if you look at a triangle, which I have in the top left corner, um, you can put a circle, fit a circle inside it, that's the inscribed circle, or just barely outside it. And the sizes of these circles are very specific. And so now if you put this triangle inside a square, you can do the same with a the square. Um, these nested circles have definite ratios. And so Kepler started to wonder if uh, the planets and the relative sizes of their orbits might have something to do with these polygons put one inside the other. But this doesn't really work because there's an infinity of possible polygons that you can draw. There's the triangle, the square, the pentagon, you can keep going. But in three dimensions, it turns out, a beautiful geometric fact that was known to Kepler, there are only five possible platonic solids, solids that are completely symmetrical and have all their faces identical. And so you could put um, six different radii spheres inside and outside these platonic solids. And so in fact, the five platonic solids clearly to Kepler explained why there were six planets. The snag is that it doesn't really work. If you try to fit them in different ways, you come close, but the orbit sizes don't exactly match. And also Kepler knew they were, the orbits were not circular, they were elliptical. And he was a good enough scientist to realize, to not be seduced by the beauty of this idea. And so he looked for something else. And the other place he looked also uh, might strike us as a little bit um, uh, unorthodox, um, which is that he thought maybe this has something to do with music theory. So um, again, there are all these ideas in music which go back uh, to Pythagoras that um, certain ratios of frequencies are consonant and so on. So there's certain intervals that are considered consonant. And Kepler wondered if the shapes and sizes of orbits and the rate at which they were, uh, that the planets traversed them had something, those ratios were somehow related to music. This was certainly an idea that was in the air at the time, I think. Um, in fact, you can see in this, uh, in this uh, passage from the Merchant of Venice, um, Shakespeare is alluding to the fact that there's music uh, when the planets move. So this was certainly an idea, but Kepler tried to take it quite literally. Okay, so I guess the last thing I, I want to do is return briefly to um, talking about Kepler again and say that his personal history, which I didn't get a chance to tell you, it's a really fascinating story. Uh, it's a subject of scholarly, bio, uh, of scholarly biographies, popular biographies, and literary fiction, even young adult novels. Um, I think there's room for a screenplay, an opera, and a graphic novel as well. These are things I hope to do myself, but I no longer expect I can. So I would like to suggest that one of you perhaps take it up. Thanks for that great introduction to Kepler and his work and the way he was thinking and sure does remind me of some of the particle physics theory that, uh, that you described. 
Uh, we have a question here from Rachel Jensen. And uh, she asks, uh, I may have misunderstood you, but did you say Brahe's nose was gold and silver? Uh, yeah, uh, I find it a little hard to understand as well. But, uh, but, but indeed, that is the story. Uh, apparently, he lost his nose in a duel. And uh, then they had a prosthetic made of, uh, I guess those were the best materials available at the time. And of course, no expense was spared because Brahe was one of the wealthiest noblemen in Europe of the day. We have another one here from, from Rachel Jensen. Um, how did he determine the distance of the planets? Yeah, that's a really good question as well. So the point is that uh, the data didn't actually show, uh, didn't contain this information. Um, all, all you saw was the direction in the sky. And it was much later that we could actually directly measure how far away. Today we do it. Well, I'll show you how we do it today, in fact. Um, but with the invention of radar, it became really direct in the 1950s. Um, so, so Kepler had to infer all of this. Um, these elliptical orbits had to have a certain size. Um, so all the laws taken together, uh, it would only hang together if the relative sizes of the orbits were um, what, they, what, what Kepler chose them to be. So he knew the relative distances of all the planets. Um, from the sun, but he didn't know the absolute distances at all. Like he didn't know how many miles it was, but he knew that uh, Jupiter is about five times as far from the sun as the Earth is. Did Kepler do all this after Tycho Brahe was dead, or you know, did he finally have time because the parties were over? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it, it might well be the case. Uh, so Brahe died soon after Kepler arrived. Uh, which is perhaps why he's <laughs> one of the suspects. Uh, actually, I'd like to address that also at this time, but first let me answer the questions that are being asked. Um, I do have a perfect alibi for Kepler. Um, so, so, uh, but with regard to when he did his work, yeah, it was, it was after Brahe died. Uh, but, but some of it was done while Brahe was still alive. And I'd like to tell you a little bit about one of the things that they had a conflict over, which is that Brahe wouldn't let him look at all the data. He said, you have to look only at Mars. And when you figured out Mars, then I'll show you the rest. <laughs> and if you look back on it, Kepler resented it bitterly, but that's actually good science, isn't it? Because that's kind of what we do with data today. You don't just, you know, fit your hypothesis to everything. What are you predicting? So Bra Brahe uh, had, had insight into, uh, into how we should treat data. That's right. Yeah. He, he was, you know, centuries ahead of his time. <laughs> So, He's also a proto-socialist, um, I might add. <laughs> but also, uh, I mean, uh, Brahe was huge at collecting data. His, he had amazing skills at uh, observing. That's right. Right. Uh, and also at running large scientific teams because he, uh, uh, you know, yeah, he, he basically had a large operation both in Denmark and then in Czechoslovakia. And he was France. making these observations without telescopes, right? That's right. The telescope arrived just a few years after Brahe died. One more question from from uh, from Rachel Jensen before we maybe go back to the uh, the talk, which is um, and she's apologizing, but you don't have to apologize, Rachel. It's good to ask questions. One more question: What are the five Platonic solids? Yeah, so so that's a um, that's that's a, that's a great question too, and these are all great questions, Rachel. So keep them coming. Um, but uh, the five Platonic solids, the there's the cube. I mean, we're basically looking for solids that are very symmetrical. Every face is the same, and so if you start thinking about what shapes those would be, there's the cube, um, and then there's the tetrahedron, which basically looks like a pyramid, except its base is also a triangle. So that makes every face a triangle. Those are the two that are easy to describe. I don't remember if I had a picture. Um, let me see if, uh, let me just scroll back and see if I had a picture of a... No, I don't have a very good picture. I have this illustration from Kepler's book, but that's not a great illustration. The others are called the dodecahedron and the octahedron. And I won't try and describe them in words, but maybe you could Google, the, Google them because they're really quite beautiful to look at. And it's quite remarkable that there's only five of them. Let's move on. Um, and move on to Newton and Einstein in part two. So, so here's a picture of uh, Newton um, by Blake, um, showing him as a mechanical god universe. Uh, I don't think it was meant to be complimentary. I think Blake found uh, Newton's vision of the world mechanistic and deterministic, uh, really quite horrifying. Um, but uh, in any case, it certainly shows the, the impression that uh, Newton made on his contemporaries. Here's the great book of Newton, um, the Principia. And uh, you can see it's, it's got quite an interesting publication history. You can see some of the relevant names here. 
This is Newton's own copy. You see the name of Samuel Pepys. Uh, Samuel Pepys was this young man about down in London um, about 20 years earlier in the 1660s. And he would have loved social media. He kind of invented tweeting or the blog um, before there were computers. So he maintained this incredibly detailed diary, which is rather tedious to read, although if you read it as a succession of tweets or in one day installments, it's more interesting. Uh, but uh, uh, around in the 1680s, he became respectable. He became a, a, a respected civil servant and the president of the Royal Society. And he received a proposal for a book which he decided was going to be the greatest book ever published. And so he spent the entire budget of the Royal Society publishing that book. But unfortunately, Newton's book, it was a book on the history of fish. And so when Newton's book arrived, um, there was no money left to publish it. But luckily, Newton's friend Edmund Halley, whose name you can see over there also on the book, um, financed the publication. So uh, here's a picture of our campus, and it shows this apple tree. Um, it's an offshoot of uh, the original apple tree. Of course, everybody's heard about Newton's apple tree and how he watched an apple fall and that inspired him. It turns out there was a real tree um, somewhere in Cambridge and this is an offshoot of it that was presented to us. Uh, and I guess the joke in the department is that once it bears fruit, I guess that's when we're gonna start having our best ideas. But what I want to do in this talk is to try to explain to you um, that uh, what the significance was of Newton's apple, it wasn't so much that he was the first person who realized that things fall down. Of course, this, had, this was known and studied by uh, Galileo as well. What Newton realized is that the same forces and the same laws that made an apple fall were the laws that governed the motion of the moon. And here's how he, uh, how he describes this idea in one of his later books. He says, imagine that if you, if you throw the apple, if you just drop the apple, of course, it falls straight down. But if you throw it, it goes on this graceful parabolic arc and then lands splat somewhere, uh, somewhere else on the floor. And the harder you throw it, the farther it falls. But if you throw it really hard, it'll never hit the earth because the earth is round and it'll bend away as Newton shows in this diagram. And so if you throw it fast enough, it'll just keep circling the earth round and round and round. And that's what the moon does. And so Newton realized that there was a unity to the things we see to apples falling down and to the moon circling the earth. And he made this precise. He discovered that if you assume that the force falls off with distance in a certain way, that it's proportional to the masses. Um, and then if you invent the calculus to prove all of these things, you could really show that these, uh, that the same laws govern the apple as the moon. And this is the thing that so impressed his contemporaries, uh, including people like Blake. Um, so, so, so that was Newton's great discovery, um, that gravity is universal. Uh, also, uh, in, his, in his great book, he was able to show that if you just have the sun and the earth, they would actually orbit each other in a way that was completely consistent, exactly consistent with Kepler's laws. Mm -hmm. So Kepler's laws were empirical. They were just based on this is what the data shows. But Newton now had a, had a theoretical explanation. He had discovered the laws which explained why, uh, why um, planets did what Kepler had said they would do. So this was a great triumph. And, uh, but I, I need to keep moving on because I promised you I was gonna take you to the frontiers of our understanding of the solar system. So let's uh, fast forward another two centuries where Newton's laws are well established. Um, oh, before, before I fast forward two centuries though, let me fast forward one century and mention another seminal event, which was an accident that another planet was discovered in the solar system. And so nothing kills your theory that there are six planets in the solar system better than the discovery of the seventh. Um, uh, but unfortunately, Kepler didn't uh, live to see this happen. Um, but uh, the ne next planet that was discovered, planet eight, this is a really dramatic story because what happened is that in the 1840s, they found that the outer planets, Uranus and Saturn and so forth, weren't exactly following the orbits that are predicted by Newton's laws. Uh, and of course, they understood why this might happen. Uh, they weren't following Kepler's laws exactly. But they, of course, understood why this might happen, because it's not just the sun that influences the orbit of planets, but also these planets affect each other. They perturb each other. And mathematics had been developed to take that into account as well. And it was a big, big success of Newton's laws that not only could you get Kepler's laws, but you could also figure out the small deviations from Kepler's laws that happened because the planets were pushing, pushing and pulling each other so that the sun was not the, the sun was the dominant influence, but it wasn't the only influence. Um, so this was this was all very nice. But by the 18, 1840s, 
it was clear that Neptune, that Uranus really wasn't uh, following even the perturbations. And so what would you do here? And really, if we were live, I might pause and ask you, what would you do? But I'll tell you what these guys did. They, they decided that there was an unknown planet, an undiscovered planet, uh, which was causing these deviations from Newton's laws. So they had such faith in Newton's laws that they predicted the existence of this unseen planet. And the remarkable thing is it was found exactly where they predicted it, the very night that the prediction was conveyed to the observers. And this is the planet Neptune, planet eight. Um, actually, soon thereafter, um, it was found that there were some further anomalies in the orbits of Uranus and Neptune as well. And so, of course, people got very excited about the possibility that there was one more planet, which is called Planet X, not to be understood as Planet 10, but Planet X. And a big search was mounted for it. And in this case, the story has resolved itself in a, in a more, more compli com complicated way. In 1930, they discovered Pluto. And here you can see the discovery photograph. Uh, you, can dis you, can see that you can discover Pluto by the fact that it's the point of light that shifts relative to the stars. Remember, that's what I said when you go out at night. You can recognize the planets because they move. And that's how Pluto was discovered. And so for a while, people thought Pluto was this planet X, which was causing the perturbations in the orbits of Uranus and Neptune. But it soon turned out Pluto was too small to be causing those perturbations, and indeed too small to be even called a planet. And what happened actually in this case is that as we continued observing these planets better and better, by 1993, it was definitively established that these anomalies that uh, people imagined they were seeing, they were imaginary. There were no anomalies. These planets were exactly following the orbits one might expect um, the, based on Newtonian gravity. There was another similar mystery, which is the orbit of uh, Mercury, which wasn't exactly uh, on, on, on uh, following the Newtonian track either. So, so this also, and this again goes back to the 1840s as well, this also led to the prediction of another planet, um, which was called Vulcan and was assumed to be closer to uh, the sun than Mercury. Uh, here in this photograph, you can see Mercury transiting in front of, uh, of the sun, the transits uh, that Kepler had discovered and predicted. Um, but the idea was that if Vulcan is closer to the sun, then Mercury must also transit the sun. And people looked for it and for about more than 50 years, and they didn't find it. All right, so that's my story of Newton, um, an, an enormously successful uh, uh, program of science. He, he created an enormously successful program of science, and in particular, it worked beautifully in the solar system. But there were one or two anomalies left over when uh, we moved to the age of Einstein and into the 20th century. So uh, as for Einstein, um, in order to briefly describe his work, I'm going to lean a lot on the fact that you already know most of it from popular culture. Uh, so you know that, sp uh, that space-time um, is this elastic medium that can be curved and bent. Uh, that was Einstein's big discovery, that gravity is just um, the curvature of space and time, that matter and energy cause space-time to get curved, and that's what produces the manifestation of gravity. Uh, here's Einstein's equation, which I just want you to look at because it's so compact and it contains all this information. Actually, it's saying exactly what I just said in words above. The left-hand side is saying space is curved and the right-hand side is saying it's matter that's causing it. Um, you need to take a course in GR, which will take you a couple of months to understand what these symbols mean, and then you'd be off and running. Um, so it's really remarkably simple. And I think one of the best things I've heard about uh, general relativity was said by Bertrand Russell, the philosopher, uh, he was already, uh, uh, and, you know, he was already famous for his work in the foundations of mathematics when he learned about general relativity. And what he said was, to think I've spent my whole life being absolute muck. And indeed, he did then you know, write a book about relativity and I think immersed himself in the subject for a while. Uh, in any case, this is Einstein at the height of his fame and at the time when he developed these ideas that gravity is, uh, a new, so in, in short, I think that what you need to take away here is that Einstein had a modified theory of gravity, which was different from Newton's. Um, and the most interesting predictions of Einstein's theory of gravity, of course, come when the gravitational fields are very strong. Uh, you get things like black holes, which are really fascinating objects, and people have discussed them and argued about them for decades um, since they were first predicted. It's an interesting story, the prediction of black, black holes because when Einstein wrote down that equation, it's quite complicated. And he also confidently asserted that nobody would ever be able to solve this equation exactly. And of course, uh, you should never make predictions like that. 
because within six months, he received this uh, paper from this guy named Schwarzschild. Six months later, he had solved the equations exactly. Um, in fact, he discovered black holes. Uh, and what's even more remarkable is that Schwarzschild solved, solved Einstein's equations while he was fighting in the First World War in the trenches in the Eastern Front. And indeed, he tragically died soon after he completed the solution. But this is exactly what I don't want to talk about, although this is a really exciting uh, subject. And we live in exciting times because black holes are being directly seen for the first time. Here you can see a simulation of a black hole in the, in the figure on the left. And on the right, you can see an actual picture of, of, of a black hole too. Um, so, so we live in exciting times, but uh, that's a subject for another day. What I want to talk about is the work that Einstein himself did with his own theory of gravity. Because the first order of business for him was to show that his theory of gravity would reduce to Newton's theory of gravity when gravitational fields were weak. Um, which they are in the solar system. The sun is pretty heavy, but even so, it's gravitation. It's not 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 a black hole, and its gravitational field is is quite weak. So Newtonian gravity is a very good approximation to Einstein's theory when gravitational fields are weak. But the nice thing is that Einstein, now that he had this complete theory, could figure out um, some deviations from Newton's theory that would happen when gravitational fields became stronger. If they became incredibly strong, space time would get terribly warped, and you get black holes. But if it got only slightly strong, uh, like close to the sun, then you would get these small deviations that Einstein could calculate. And so he set about calculating the orbit of Mercury within this um, almost Newtonian approximation to his theory. And the discovery, the, the analysis he did, they say it left him with uh, heart palpitations, Einstein said afterwards, because he found that within his theory of gravity, the orbit of Mercury would actually precess slowly um, and it would do so in exactly the way that was observed, in exactly the way that people had failed to explain and were looking for Vulcan in order to explain. This came out of Einstein's theory of gravity. So, so this was a huge success. And um, it's an example of what I mean by using the solar system for fundamental science. Um, I guess all of this, these are examples, great examples of how the solar system has uh, been a laboratory for fundamental science, but it's also the first evidence of Einstein's ideas of space and time which are some of the most profound and exciting uh, intellectual ideas um, uh, in the history of, humans, you know, of humanity. Um, so, so I want to talk, tell you a little bit more about this, uh, about what happens when you have small corrections to Newtonian gravity. Another famous prediction of Einstein's was that when you have starlight passing close to the sun, it will deflect, as you can see in this image on the bottom right. And that's greatly exaggerated. The light actually goes almost in a straight line. When it grazes the sun, it bends very slightly. Uh, the way in which you can observe it is through a total eclipse of the sun, because, this, because when the sun is eclipsed, you can see the stars that are near it, that are behind it. Uh, and those stars are not in exactly the positions they would be if the sun wasn't there. So you can observe those stars during the eclipse, and then you can observe the same stars six months later, as shown in those two schematics on the right again, uh, in the upper panels. Um, and because of the small deflections of, of these stars, you can test uh, Einstein's theory of gravity. And this test also passed with flying colors. Another interesting test of Einstein's theory is, um, is something called the principle of equivalence. So here's an event we hold in the physics department every fall. We drop two pumpkins of Strosacker, one big pumpkin and one small pumpkin. According to both Einstein and Newton, and for that matter, Galileo as well, both pumpkins should hit the Earth at the same time. This is called the principle of equivalence that gravity acts in the same way on all, all, all matter. Uh, of course, this is not a very accurate test of the experiment. It's really an excuse to have fun, and maybe some cider and, uh, and uh, pumpkin pie. But uh, a really interesting experiment you can do, and this maybe sets the stage for the talk we'll have next week, uh, was the only piece of science that was carried out by the Apollo 11 mission. They carried these mirrors and left them on the surface of the moon. So these are nice and robust. They're just mirrors. You just leave them lying over there. But what you can do with these mirrors is that you can measure the distance to the moon because you can shoot a laser at the moon, it bounces off the mirror, and it comes right back to Earth. And you can measure the distance of the moon to millimeter accuracy. And so there's all sorts of cool things you can do. You can discover that the moon has moonquakes, just like the Earth has earthquakes. You can discover that the moon is drifting away from the Earth, which was known before, but you could measure it really precisely. But another thing you can discover is that the Earth and the moon are like pumpkins falling towards the sun. And they're different sized pumpkins. And so you can measure whether they're falling at the same rate or not. And as far as we can tell, and this is much better than our pumpkin drop, 
are the principle of, principle of equivalence is satisfied, which is another stringent test of Einstein's theory of gravity. And then one last test I want to tell you about um, uh, in this segment is something called frame dragging, which says that space-time around the Earth is curved, but the way in which it's curved is different depending on whether it's at rest or rotating. If the Earth wasn't rotating, space would be curved in a certain way, but because it's rotating, it gets twisted around further. And so this is called frame dragging. And here's how conceptually you could test it. Suppose you had three twins named A, B, and C, and they're all equipped with rocket packs, and so they can fly around at will. Um, so B just hangs over the Earth and stays there. A goes around the Earth, and C goes around the Earth too, but they go in different directions. C goes the same way as the Earth is rotating, and A goes against the rotation of the Earth. And what they find is that when they all reconvene after they've walked around the Earth, after two of them have circumnavigated the Earth, is that they're all different ages, um, and that A is the youngest and C is the oldest. And this, this is an effect that you may have heard of the twin paradox um, in special relativity, but this is due to the gravity of the Earth and to the nature of the gravitational field around a rotating body. It's a very small effect. And the remarkable thing is that we now have the technology to measure it. Um, you don't actually send a bunch of twins uh, flying around the Earth on rocket packs. Instead, what you do is you just have a single satellite. And the same effect that causes these twins to age differently also drags the orbit of the satellite as shown schematically in this picture. You see that orbit and you see that red arrow showing the way in which the orbit gets dragged. Now, of course, this is a very small effect. It's barely measurable. And there are many other things that drag that orbit also. The fact that the Earth is not perfectly round, the pressure of light from the sun, air drag, the fact that the tides slosh around, all of those things affect the orbit of the satellite equally or more than the drag uh, due to the warping of space-time and the moon and planets too. So it's a very delicate measurement, and uh, it's, but it's remarkable that we, can, we understand all these other effects well enough that we can actually test this prediction of Einstein too and his theory of passes and flying colors. And here's the satellite that's used to make this experiment. It's this beautiful disco ball. Um, it's completely passive. There's no electronics. It's just nice and shiny because we want to shine lasers off it to measure its position. David Moore asks, you say that the path of light changes when coming close to a star. Does light slow down when coming close to the star? It, it doesn't slow down, but the time it takes to propagate uh, becomes a bit different. And that's another test of general relativity you can do, which is called the Shapiro delay, uh, which also I was tempted to include, but um, you know, because that's also done with spacecraft, and so it's more contemporary. Uh, the original bending of starlight experiment was done in 1919, and they had an expedition. They went by boat to you know, the Southern Hemisphere. Um, so that's very 19th century almost. And uh, the Cassini experiment, which measures the Shapiro delay, um, is very 21st century with spacecraft. So I would love to show you that. Are there any other tests of general relativity like that in the solar system? Yeah, there are, there are quite a few other tests that are going on. Uh, but I wasn't going to show any more, because I wanted to now talk about uh, yeah, something, well, you'll see what I'm going to talk about. Right. The phantom menace. <laughs> I, I could take the opportunity to answer the question from the last session about the graphic novel, a screen Ah, great. Right? Okay. Yeah. Why don't okay. you do that? Yeah. Yeah. So I'm actually going to duck the question a little bit, maybe, maybe but I'm ha happy to talk to you about it offline if you if you really are interested in taking up this idea of writing a graphic novel or, or, or screenplay. Um, there are many interesting aspects to Kepler's life. There's the witchcraft, uh, you know, the witchcraft trial of his mother. Um, and uh, uh, but I want to tell you about his alibi. Why I'm pretty sure he didn't murder Brahe. It's because Kepler also wrote the first science fiction, what might be arguably the first work of science fiction late in his life. He wrote this book uh, about this uh, small boy who travels to the moon. Well, it starts off with a small boy. He live, lives with his formidable mother, who's like uh, an herbalist and a witch actually in the story. Uh, but from, from that story, what you learn a little bit about, you learn a little bit about his relationship with his mother who was clearly quite a formidable woman, but Kepler had tremendous respect for her, for her knowledge. And I think if she had not been a woman instead of being tried for witch, witchcraft, she might have been recognized as the father of botany or the mother of botany in the same way that Kepler is the father of astronomy. And I think Kepler was conscious of that and that comes across in his, in his story uh, about her. But she is certainly, uh, you know, maybe not the most nurturing uh, mother. And at some point she loses him and he winds up as a small boy 
the protagonist, he doesn't say he's Kepler, but we presume he's Kepler. He winds up on this island in Denmark and he's uh, on which there's a character named Brahe <laughs> who takes him in and uh, you know shelters him and brings him up and and eventually re reunites him with his mother. So so clearly he felt quite kindly towards uh, towards Brahe uh, later in life. And and what was the fiction part of this? Oh yes, I forgot to tell you the science fiction part. Right? <laughs> this is, yeah, the science fiction part was that he does travel to the moon with the help of his mother. Uh -huh. And uh, it's not very good science fiction because there's no real plot to the story. <laughs> um, it's really a rather tedious description of how the you know we we know what things look like from the earth, but what would they look like as seen from the moon? I, I suppose it's quite dramatic, but you know, having actually you know lived through a moon landing now. Um, you know, it's a little bit over it now. We're not over the moon landing, though, of course. The next, next talk is all about returning to the moon, which we're very excited about. And maybe building uh, telescopes there and things like that, and boot bases and stuff. Yeah, yeah. Definitely, we live in exciting times. I want to zoom out to the outer solar system and tell you about um, the realm of Pluto and its cousins. So this is called the Kuiper Belt. Um, the objects, the icy objects that lie beyond the orbit of Neptune. And Pluto, we now know, is not a planet. It's really just a small chunk of ice. And it's just one of the many thousands of chunks of ice that you see in this artist's conception. I don't have to just show you an artist's conception, though, because uh, we've actually had a flyby uh, in our lifetimes of Pluto and its satellite. And so Pluto is no longer just a little point of light shifting on the sky. Uh, we can see mountains on the planet. Um, and or, or not planet, uh, but whatever it is. We can see mountains there, we can see its satellite. And here we can see another Kuiper Belt object which they arranged to fly past as well, um, which looks like a snowman. And uh, so these are really fascinating, uh, fascinating objects. And we're learning a lot about the origins of the solar system as we study them and get to know them better. But in this talk, I'm going to zoom out again. I'm not really interested in their geology. I'm more interested in them as just point masses orbiting the sun and in their orbits. So from this perspective, the Kuiper Belt objects fall into four families. There's a few of them whose orbits are clearly in lockstep with the heavy planet Neptune. Some of them take twice as long to go around the sun as Neptune does, and some of them take one and a half times. So every time Neptune goes uh, three times around the sun, they go twice. So they're marching in lockstep, and that's called the resonant Kuiper Belt. Uh, there's something called the classical Kuiper belt, where you've got um, these icy chunks, which are not exactly in lockstep, but they're somewhere in between these two orbits that are in lockstep. And the vast majority of Kuiper belt objects live in these orbits. But there are also objects called the scattered disk objects, which have very eccentric orbits. So they're really squished ellipses. They come in maybe quite close to Neptune, but then they swoop out and they go out for hundreds of astronomical units. I should give you some idea about the scale of the solar system. So an astronomical unit is the distance between the Earth and the sun. And uh, it takes about eight minutes for light to travel that distance. So, or it's, a hundred and, it's about 100 million miles. So it's a big distance, an astronomical unit. But Neptune is about uh, 40 astronomical units from the sun. So it's 40 times as far uh, as the Earth. These scattered disk Kuiper belt objects, they'll come, to, come quite close to Neptune's orbit when they're closest to the sun, but then they swoop out and they go to hundreds or even thousands of astronomical units away from the sun on the outward swing. You also have objects called centaurs, which have really chaotic orbits. They'll swoop into the inner solar system and they'll swoop out and so on. Um, and so they're, they're quite interesting too. But these are the four families. Uh, and some of the historical highlights, of course, were the discovery of the Kuiper Belt objects, which took place. Well, Pluto was found anomalously early, and we thought it was a planet for about 60 years, but it was found in the 19, 1930s. Uh, the second Kuiper Belt object was found in the 1990s, and that's when it was recognized that there must be hundreds or thousands of these which have now been found. Uh, but there's a whole new family of these, that the first of which was is called Sedna, and it was discovered in 2003. But many more have been discovered in the last seven or eight years, uh, maybe a couple dozen, which I call the Sedna family. And the thing about this family of objects is that they don't come close to Neptune even. They, they, uh, their closest distance to the sun is about 60 astronomical units. So that's comparable to Neptune, but they never get close to Neptune. So they're not really particularly influenced 
by Neptune or the inner planets. And then they swoop out to hundreds of astronomical units. So they have these really clean orbits in the sense that they're not perturbed very much by the inner solar system. It's just the sun and them. And so they should have really perfect ellipses, right? That's what you'd think. But uh, here's what, we, what you actually find when you look at the Sedna family. Yes, they do have elliptical orbits as far as we can tell. None of them have completed these orbits because they take hundreds of years to go around. Um, and uh, we haven't been observing them for hundreds of years. But based on the observations we have, we can fit their orbits. And this is a rather busy picture. So what I want you to do is just look at those purple ellipses. There's about six of them. And what you notice is that these ellipses are not random. They're not pointing every which way, as you might expect. And as happens for the other um, Kuiper Belt objects, those orbits are completely randomized in their orientation. But these six objects, they're all kind of lined up. I mean, they're not perfectly lined up, but they're all pointing kind of um, southwest in this diagram, right? Um, so, so that's kind of mysterious and puzzling. And that's led to, uh, and so astronomers, people who study the Kuiper Belt, um, have been asking themselves what could possibly cause this alignment. And one possibility is that this alignment is evidence for a heavy planet in the outer solar system, an undiscovered planet, which is called Planet Nine. Uh, the proposal is that this planet is about 500 astronomical units from the sun, and it's quite big. It's five to 10 Earth masses. So it's not a giant planet like Jupiter or Saturn or Neptune, but it's a lot bigger than the Earth. Um, these parameters, how big it is, how far it is, uh, they come from trying to, uh, trying to explain the alignment of the orbits. If you assume that these are, these are the orbital parameters, then you get the alignment to happen best. But there's a range of parameters. So the upshot is that it's not quite like the situation with Neptune, which was predicted. They knew exactly where in the sky you had to look. Over here, we have a general idea of where Planet Nine might be, if it's responsible for the alignment of those Kuiper Belt orbits. So, so that's the status of Planet Nine. And of course, it's become a really hot topic in the field and people have been looking for it. Um, but what I want to do is, I want to explore, uh, I want to tell you a little bit about my work over here in the last few, last few minutes of this talk. And I want to tell you about some work in progress where we have an outlandish idea uh, but an interesting one, I think, um, about what might explain this alignment and has nothing to do with the planet nine. So, so this is sort, of, sort of goes back to the idea that the orbit of Mercury, was there a planet or was there some change in the law of gravity that was needed? And we're proposing that over here also, this alignment, rather than it being a planet, might be due to some modification, some correction to Newton's law of gravity. So you might be thinking to yourself, well, why are we applying Newtonian gravity? Don't we have Einstein's theory? And maybe that's all it is. Uh, you're telling me that Newtonian gravity does produce this alignment? Well, why don't you just use Einstein's theory? Well, the answer to that is Einstein's theory and Newton's theory predict exactly the same thing uh, for the Kuiper belt. But remember, the deviations between the two theories, the differences between the two theories happen when gravitational fields are strong. They happen close to the sun, not far away from the sun. So whatever it is, it's definitely not um, due to general relativity or Einstein's theory of gravity. And it doesn't happen in Newtonian gravity either, unless there's another planet. Um, but now I want to talk about something completely different for a few minutes, and then I'll bring it right back to the Kuiper belt. I want to go into even deeper space and talk about galaxies now. And so uh, the solar system I was telling you is pretty big, but galaxies are immense compared to that. Um, this is the Andromeda galaxy, which is a twin of our own galaxy, which we, of course, can't see from outside. But it extends about 100,000 light years uh, across. The solar system is thousands of astronomical units. And this is th hundreds of thousands of, um, uh, of, of light years, so much bigger. Uh, but the thing about galaxies is they're, they're very pretty. But what I want to do is not just look, admire them, but also to look at the motion of the stars uh, in a galaxy. And this was studied. Um, uh, well, it was studied by many people, but an interesting discovery about this was made by Vera Rubin in the 1990s. What she did was she measured the, the, the stars in a, in a galaxy like Andromeda. They move in circular orbits about the galactic center. And so what she did was she measured the speed at which they were moving as a function of distance. That's what you see in this plot on the left. Uh, and I should also say that picture on the right is Vera Rubin as an undergraduate. Um, so um, the, the work that, was, was, that she did was done somewhat later in her life. Uh, but what, it, what she found is, what you see in this plot, that as you move away from the center of the galaxy, 
the speed of the stars at first rises, which actually makes sense within Newtonian gravity. And then it just flattens out. You expect in Newtonian gravity that the stars should start moving slower as you go further and further from the galactic center, but they don't. And so this is, this is a big mystery. The conventional explanation for this mystery, oh, here's the same data that's been replotted. And I guess I'll just use this as an advertisement for a future talk I hope we might have by my colleague, Stacey McGaw, who studied this galaxy rotation problem uh, quite extensively. But the conventional explanation for this, for this behavior is that there's a lot of matter, missing matter that we don't see in the galaxy. This is the famous dark matter that you've probably heard talks about in this series and you've heard about elsewhere also. The basic idea is that the galaxy contains about six times as much matter as we can see in the stars and in the gas. And this dark matter, its gravity is what's causing those rotation curves to behave the way they do. So that's the conventional explanation for uh, galaxy rotation. And um, this is called the dark matter paradigm. And there's a lot of good um, concordances, good reasons uh, uh, to believe in dark matter. Um, it, there's certainly evidence for dark matter in cosmology, in astronomy, and also the many particle physics models that predict the existence of dark matter. So it's a successful paradigm, except for one fly in the ointment, that dark matter is observed only indirectly through its gravitational effects. Nobody has ever seen it directly. Uh, my colleague, Dan Akarib, uh, former colleague, Dan Akarib, uh, who is one of the world's leading experimentalists in this field, uh, one time we were trying to help a speaker uh, set up his talk and the projector wasn't cooperating and the screen just kept saying no signal. And Dan said, you know what? That's actually a good summary of all the talks I give. So that is kind of the embarrassment in the field of dark matter that after 30 or 40 years of looking, we've seen it directly. And so that does uh, um, give you license to entertain competing ideas. Um, including this idea that there might be a modification of gravity. And there's a modified gravity theory called MOND, which says that Newton's laws and Einstein's laws don't work when gravitational fields are extremely weak. It's a very well-defined mathematical framework, and it works beautifully in galaxy rotation. And that's what uh, my colleague Stacey McGaw has documented uh, beautifully over decades now, how well it works in the galaxy. Um, however, this, this modified gravity theory called MOND has many critics and it has many problems. And uh, I was going to tell you a little bit about some of those problems, but I realized that in light of the time, maybe I'll circle back to this if you ask me about some of the problems that Mond is. What I'd like to do is I'd like to pick up on an idea that I'm working on with my colleague, Kate Brown. We decided that cosmology is very inaccessible, but the solar system is, is right here. It's our backyard. So can we test Mond gravity within the solar system? This theory works on galactic scales, if it works in the solar system or if it fails in the solar system, we could make some progress here. Um, so in this picture, uh, I'm showing you the gravitational, uh, I'm showing you what happens within the solar system if you apply Mond gravity instead of Newtonian gravity. Uh, it turns out that not much happens, not much changes in the inner solar system if you only take into account the sun. Uh, the kind of gravitational field you get in Mond gravity, one way to think about it is, it's the same gravitational field you'd get in Newtonian gravity if the sun was surrounded by this halo of mass. This phantom mass halo, it's, it starts out at about 7,000 astronomical units, so well outside the Kuiper belt. And um, it looks kind of like you see in this picture. Um, it's there, it's this sort of halo, and then it fades out again. That's what, the, that's what modern gravity predicts the gravitational field uh, within the solar system is like if you take into account only the sun. But if you also take into account that the galaxy also exerts a gravitational force on solar system objects, then it turns out that the gravitational field in the solar system, according to Mond, is a little bit different. It's the same field as you would get in Newtonian gravity if the sun was surrounded by, again, this halo of phantom mass, but this halo is now no longer symmetrically distributed around the sun. It's more concentrated in the direction where the galaxy is. So it produces what's called a quadrupolar gravitational field inside the solar system. Now, you don't need to know what quadrupolar gravitational field means. You just need to know that it produces a gravitational field in the inner solar system, which gets stronger as you get further out. So Mond gravity is saying that you should expect to see deviations from Newtonian predictions in the outer solar system. So that, of course, uh, caused our ears to prick up. Uh, deviations from, Newton from Newtonian gravity that happen in the outer solar system instead of the inner. Um, sounds like something. 
Uh, and so we took a crash course in solar system dynamics, uh, which is not a subject, you know, it's a very well-developed subject, but not one we were experts in. And that's part of the fun of doing this. We could pick up this textbook uh, on graduate solar system dynamics. And not only did it help us with our project, but when the movie Don't Look Up opened, we could understand some of the, you know, techno battle that the actors were uh, trading back and forth when they were acting as astronomers. So, so it really had positive benefits. Uh, one of the fun things we learned uh, since we're new to this field of solar system dynamics is that there really is something called a minor planet database, also referenced in, uh, in Don't Look Up. And so we could look up all the Sedna family, uh, we could look up their orbits and so on. Uh, and let me tell you in a nutshell, what we found is uh, truly remarkable. What we found is that Mont gravity predicts that these, these orbits of, these, of the Sedna family will line up exactly as Planet 9 would make them line up. The effects are comparable in order of magnitude. And not only does it predict that they should line up, but it predicts they should line up um, with the direction to the center of the galaxy. And that's not something you get out of planet nine, that's a prediction of our theory. And so we were uh, not quite like Einstein having palpitations of the heart, but you know this was definitely a moment when we found it should line up with the galaxy. And then we plotted up the data, which we had to look up uh, in this minor planet database. And you can see the outcome over here. The blue arrow shows the direction to the center of the galaxy. And those ellipses are um, six uh, Sedna family orbits. And you see uh, how well they line up. Now, what does this actually mean? Um, well, we don't know. I mean, there are, uh, to be fair, we only have six objects right now. So this could mean one of three things. It could turn out that when more Sedna family objects are discovered, that this clustering was just an accident and the signal will go away. That has been known to happen. Like, uh, you know, planet X turned out not to exist because the anomalies in the data went away. But anomalies in the data have also led to the discovery of Neptune and to general relativity. So it's clear that the Kuiper belt is a laboratory for studying fundamental physics. And the exciting thing is that we'll know the answer soon. Uh, there are many experiments that are going to be performed that are going to map out the outer solar system as well as other parts of the universe. And of these, the leading observatory that's going to be coming online soon is the Vera Rubin Observatory. And I think it's just so fitting that an observatory like Vera Rubin might possibly discover a connection between the outer solar system and galactic rotation. The Origin Science Scholars Lectures are presented by Case Western Reserve University's Institute for the Science of Origins, with the assistance of the Siegel Lifelong Learning Program, the College of Arts and Sciences, and MediaVision. For more information on the Origin Science Scholars Program, including a full video archive, please visit the Institute's website at origins.case.edu.